Luke chapter 24, and uh, let's look at the verses in verse 44, and we'll read to the um, verse 44 to verse 49. Shall we stand as we read the scriptures together? Uh, Luke chapter 24, <clears throat> and we'll begin our reading in verse um, 44. The scripture says this, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. In verse 47, which I want to use an expression in there as our text, Jesus commanded them, he gave them the commission here to preach repentance and remission of sins in his name. And you see the scope of it, all nations, all nations. But then he says, beginning at Jerusalem. And I want to speak to that on the subject, remembering our mission, remembering our mission. It is to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Let's pray together. Shall we bow our heads? Our Father and our God, we thank you for who you are. Thank you for this time to meet. Thank you for this midweek service. And Father, we now ask that you would flow through us with your Holy Spirit and power. And as Jesus did here as we read the scripture, he opened their eyes that they could understand the scriptures. And Father, we ask you to do that here tonight. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. You may have heard this story, but it's the legend, what we call a wonder of the world, the Taj Mahal. And if you remember, if you know the story, there was an emperor, his name was Shah Jahan, and his wife died. He was devastated by it. It turned his life completely upside down. And so much so that he vowed, he made a vow to honor her memory with a construction of a temple that would be her tomb, which we know today as the Taj Mahal. Her coffin was placed in the center of a large piece of land, and the temple began to be built around that coffin of this emperor's wife. No expense was spared. Everything he had, he poured in to that temple. Her final resting place would become what we consider, many consider the great wonder of the world. But weeks turned into months and months turned into years and his grief over his wife subsided. His passion for the temple grew and the construction consumed him day after day. And while one day he was, they completed the construction and the Taj Mahal was built and all was done. And while walking from one side of the construction site to the other, his leg bumped into a wooden box and he brushed the dust off his leg and ordered the worker to throw that box out. He didn't know that he had ordered the disposal of his beloved wife's coffin, which now forgotten was hidden beneath layers of dust. It's a story that is true. It's a story maybe you've heard, but it's something that is applicable to each of us to understand this truth. We often forget the mission that Christ has given to us. We are here in the walls of a church. We are here tonight in a midweek service. We're here, we sing the songs of the hymns we just sang. We pray, we have prayer time together. We open the Word of God and we teach it, we preach it, and we go our separate ways and come back again the weekend and we do our work, we do our labor. I want to remind you tonight, and I want to give you hopefully from the Scripture some remembrances, something to remember so that we never get to the place that we go about all of these things and we forget why we are doing it. 
And we forget the passion and the ambition and the goal and the vision that we've been given from the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there may be two different groups in here tonight. I don't know, but maybe in a church this size and a crowd this size, more than likely, maybe. But I don't know where your heart is tonight, and I am not at all coming to you with a, uh, a judgmental spirit whatsoever. But I do want to ask you the question tonight. Why are you here? Why are you here on a Wednesday evening? Listen, when it comes to the royalty, which is Jesus Christ, it ought to be something we never get over. You don't doze off when royalty is present. We do not become ho-hum when the presence of God Almighty and we are on holy ground. That does not become a norm to us. It must be something that we continually gaze and we wonder at what Christ has done for us. I preached this past Sunday, and it was exciting to see a young man that was there. He's a middle-aged guy, and, and uh, you could just tell by what I taught in Sunday school and preached and presented, and he sat there, and he, he was just excited the whole time. And, uh, and then there's others, you know, they're just kind of whatever. And, but, man, he just hung on. He was on the edge of his seat, had his Bible open, just followed the whole way through. And, and those are the ones you spot, and those are the ones you preach at, and you enjoy that. And God gives you that to encourage you. But then afterward, he came up, and I talked to him. I said, how long have you been here? What's, what's God done? And, of course, he began to tell me what God had done in his life, brought him from a life of addiction and saved him and changed his life. And this is the place, this church is where he began to grow. And, and that is someone who has hung on to the wonder of what Christ has done in his life. And may the Lord do that for each of us. Let's look at the Scripture tonight. And I want to remind you some things that Jesus gave us. This is... The day, we read the scripture correctly and we understand this correctly, this is the day of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we just celebrated Resurrection Sundays, we remember that very special day. Every Lord's Day is a day that we celebrate. That's why we meet on Sunday. It's the first day of the week because of the resurrection. But as we just celebrated Resurrection Sunday, and, and this is Jesus speaking to his disciples here and others that were present, the two that were on the Emmaus Road, they were the ones that were present here as well. And Jesus is speaking to them and he gives them these words. And in, I, in verses 50, as we come to those last scripture there, as he's led them away as far as Bethany, there's really, don't forget, there's about a 40-day period of time between those verses because there was 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. But nonetheless, this in verse 44 and 4 through 49 is the commission, the words of encouragement, the words of challenge that Jesus gave to his disciples. Let's look at them together. And I want to give you three, three reminders that Jesus gave that I think can help us that we continue to have the passion and not lose the passion of why we're serving the Lord. Number one, I believe Jesus wanted them to remember the Scriptures. The Scriptures. Look at what he says in verse 45, and I love this verse because it's something that we can pray for individually as a believer every time we open the pages of God's Word and truly say, Lord, open our eyes and help us that we might understand. And it says here that Jesus did that. He opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. I believe what is lacking more than anything in any of our lives, it is that which is a lacking of the power and the need of the Scriptures in our lives personally. The Word of God. The Word of God. And as you see in verse 44, this is what Jesus taught. He taught those, the, the two that were on the Emmaus Road. He opened the Word of God and shared with them the Scriptures concerning Himself. He does it in verse 44. Look at it together with me. It says, These are the words that I spake unto you while I was with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Aren't you glad we have the Scriptures to resort to? And the song we sang tonight, 
dwelling in Buda land that talked about that refuge, that fortress that the scriptures are that we can turn to. Buda land's not talking about heaven. That's the Buda land we can have here on the earth as we serve the Lord Jesus Christ and walk with Him daily. And the Word of God is that central part of getting the Word we need from God that He can speak to us daily. And as we commune with Him in prayer, that fellowship that is there, it's the scriptures that which motivates us. It feeds us. It nourishes us daily. And without it, without it, you will lose sight of why you are here. You'll get your eyes on everything around you. You'll get your eyes on the carpet and the pain, the person sitting beside you and what they're doing and what they're wearing. You'll get your eyes on anything under the sun besides the most important thing if you get your eyes off the pages of God's Word. Jesus led them to the Scriptures. And in the Scriptures, I believe there's two things that we need to be reminded of. And I believe it is this one because it transformed the disciples, and that is the resurrection. The resurrection. When they understood this, when it sunk in. If you look at the verses, I think it's an interesting phrase. And it's in verse, 40, or verse uh, 38. Look at that verse. It says, and he said unto them, why are you troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. God is so, Jesus is so gracious, isn't he? He should have said, hey guys, come on, you get over your feelings. This, this is truly me. But he says, look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. H- handle me. Handle me. And see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. Then verse 41, look. And while they yet believed not for joy... And wondered. Can you imagine if you can understand that? They were so overjoyed, they could not believe this was truly Him. But when it sunk in that this Jesus that they followed had conquered the grave, there was nothing stopping them. You read the book of Acts, nothing stopped them. Peter, the one that had just failed, he's standing in Acts chapter 2 preaching and 3,000 souls are saved. A few chapters later, he's preaching 5,000 souls are saved. And you find every one of them laying down their life for the Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrection changed it all. Changed it all. We look back to that and may that passion and desire continue to burn in our hearts. Listen, we serve a risen Savior. We are victorious tonight. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Yeah, he laid laid down his life for me. Yes, he took the wrath of God that I deserved upon himself. But listen, he is alive forevermore tonight. And because he is alive, I have life and I have victory. And you do too. That's the resurrection of Jesus. But for us, we look forward as the disciples had to grasp that. We must grasp it. But there's something else I believe from Scripture that we need to grasp that I think many times we fail to grasp. And that is this. The Word of God teaches Jesus is going to return. I think we lose sight of that all the time. We forget days are short. It may be our own life. God could call us home at any moment. Life's short. You only get one chance at this. One chance. You only get one life to live. But also remember, Jesus could come back tonight. He could come back tomorrow. He could come back next week. He could come back at any moment. And whatever time we have, this is it. This is it. Do you understand that? I, I, I think many times we fail to, to get it. And many in, sitting in churches today forget this very thing. He will return. What is the challenge that Jesus gives to us? If you would look with me also in the Gospel of Luke and turn to chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Just look at these few verses quickly with me. Luke chapter 12. And look what the Scripture says in verse 40. 
Remember, what did Jesus do? He, he, he expounded the scriptures to them. Yes, he used his hands and feet. He said, listen, handle my hands. Handle me. See for yourself who this is. I am Jesus. And, and they still, they're just like, they, this, this is too good to be true. But then he opened the scriptures to them. And then everything became, began to make sense. They understood what the prophet said and the psalm says and, and the law. They, they understood because of the scriptures. Oh, may the scriptures grip us tonight. May they sink and may it truly our, our hearts be open, our minds be open and we understand this. Look what Jesus says in verse 40. Don't forget it. He says this, Be ye therefore ready also. Be ready. For the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Then he gave us two challenges, I believe, in verse 42. He says, the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward? And his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give him their portion of meat in due season. Then he says, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Two titles, really. We, we are we are a steward. Moreover, it is required of a man in stewards that a man be found faithful. We are stewards tonight. God is everything you have. Don't forget, everything you have is given to you by God. He gives it to you to manage. You're a steward of it. You may have your name on a deed or a title, but listen, don't forget, you don't own that. God gave it to you. God gave it to you. Uh, by Him all things consist. He is the preeminent one, and by him, may, may, may He have the preeminence in our life. May He be first place. And remembering that everything I have is from Him. And I am a manager of it. That's why one day the Bible says, don't forget, there's a judgment seat. And we will stand and we'll give an account for how we manage this. How did we manage our spouse? How did we manage our children, our home, our church, the positions God gave us, the job He gave us? We'll answer for all of these things. And we'll give an account, be rewarded accordingly. Not only that in verse 43, but we're a servant. Don't forget that. If there's one thing that unites a church and brings a great spirit to a church, and that is understanding that each of us are just servants for each other. Well, number one, we're servants for the Lord. We serve Him. But when we serve the Lord, it's understanding that we serve each other. Let each other have, uh, let each esteem other better than themselves. That's what Philippians 2 says. We're servants. Are you ready for His return? You don't have to go very far in the world. You don't have to go very far in Reno and places we have been and seen different places. There are just vast and vast amount of people that are just living for the here and now. It's about here. It's about now. It's about my life. They, I truly think people have an idea that they're going to live forever and they'll never die. By looking at the way they live, that's what you would come to the conclusion. Listen, Christians, we're only here for a short time. And remember what the Bible says, we're pilgrims, we're strangers. And remember, we're just passing through this place. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're ambassadors for Jesus Christ here. This is not our home. Heaven's our home. And while we're here, may we be busy. Be ready. Jesus opened the scriptures. Remember the scriptures. Let them sink into your heart. And then secondly, I believe when we understand the scriptures and we remember what the scriptures say, we will remember another thing. And that is this. You're sent. You're sent. Look what Jesus gave them in chapter 24. As he opened the scriptures to them, then he gives them in verse 46, this is really the gospel in the nutshell, according to 1 Corinthians 15 as well, that it behooved Christ to suffer. He died, he was buried, and to rise from the dead the third day. It's, it's the gospel fulfilled right there. And that repentance and remission, without the gospel we have no repentance or remission of sins. That's the, it's, it's the result of the gospel. It should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And notice this. And ye are witnesses of these things. You're sent. You're the witnesses of them. You have seen it. Now you are the witnesses and you are to go. What is the commission? All nations. All nations. But it starts here in Jerusalem. 
It did start in Jerusalem. It stayed in Jerusalem. God sent persecution upon it, and it spread throughout. But in that spreading, it went through all of the regions. And later we have the Apostle Paul coming on the scene and all over Asia Minor. But the gospel went, and today we have it here in our country. And the gospel is being spread around the world. Listen, it is still my mission. It is still your mission. If you are a representative and a recipient of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what it has done in your life, listen, you are a witness. You fall into this category right here. And so the all nations is my business. The all nations is yours. Beginning at Jerusalem is mine. Beginning at Jerusalem is yours. This is our mission personally. It's not enough to walk inside of a church and say, well, that's what the church does. No, that's what we do individually. It's my job. It is your job. This mission of all nations beginning at Jerusalem. We're sent I believe that falls into two categories. We're sent. And there's two types of people here in the room tonight. If you're a believer, you're born again, you're a follower of Christ. There should be two types of people in this room this evening. Either you're going or you're giving. Just two types of people. Two types of believers. Either you're going or you're giving. William Carey, a great missionary... And in his biography, uh, he gives the account of a, the new missionary society that he formed in 1792. And um, Andrew Fuller was a great part of that, an instrumental. I don't hear a lot about Andrew Fuller, but he had pastored many, many years in the New England states and was instrumental in the part of William Carey's life. And that part that played the role for William Carey was simply this. As they met together and spoke of the country of India and how they were going to get into that country. And all they could think about with India was that it was just a vast mine, and many called it a gold mine or a, a deep pit. And it was in, they even considered it to be in the center of the earth. And the question was raised, who will go there? Who will go there? And William Carey spoke up in that meeting, and he said this, and these are his famous words, He says, I'll go if you'll hold the ropes. I'll go if somebody will just hold the rope for me. I'll go. Andrew Fuller spoke up. He says, I'll hold the rope for you. And those men and William Carey, they made a vow that day that they would never give up and let go of that rope so that William Carey could get to India. And because some of God's people, Christians, that had given their life for the cause of Christ, and they decided to hold the rope for Carrie, he went to India. God blessed in an amazing way. Read his story. But I was just there in 2019 uh, at, a, at a pastor's meeting, preaching there and for a, a, another pastor friend of mine who does mission work there and, and, and being able to see this in the southern part of India, just the one small part of India, but being able to preach and, and 400 and some Bible college students there and 400 and some uh, pastors from all over India come for this meeting and to be able to stand and preach and, and to see it and to actually take effect, to understand something that way back here in the late 1700s, somebody said... I'll go. Others said, I'll hold the rope for you. And here we are today in the year 2000 being able to see the fruit of what somebody did for the Lord Jesus Christ. And India goes strong for the sake of the gospel. It's an amazing thing what God has done. Hold the ropes. God uses us in different ways to do that. People in our church in Greenville, God used widows. God used widows in our church to hold the rope. They couldn't do a whole lot. They, they did visit it and tried to do what they could, but there were those that got the idea, I may not be able to do much, but I can hold the rope for somebody. I can pray, I can give, and they did. I had a layman, name was Carl. He was just a railroad worker. God had blessed him, and, and uh, he, he had, something had sunk into his heart by one of our speakers that just simply said, one of these missions, it was a missions conference, and he said somebody needs to strap themselves to that young man so that that young man can get to the field. And he got a hold of that. And let me tell you, he, God poured through him. 
And he just gave and gave and gave, trying to get people to where they needed to go. He understood something. Somebody's got to hold the ropes. you got missionaries here back on your wall. You need to hold the ropes for them. Are you involved in that? Are you involved in that? Personally. Well, the church does. No, are you involved in it personally? It's your responsibility. It's my responsibility. Do you understand as Jesus spoke at this moment, there were just a few people here. And what God did from this little meeting of people that got a hold of the idea, Jesus has risen. He is alive. He has conquered the grave. He is victorious. We're going to wait for the power that he gives and we're going to obey his voice and go out and do what he's called us and sent us to do. And look where we are today, just by a small group of people. Hudson Taylor said the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. And only do we hold the ropes for those where you're in Reno. We're to be outreaching people for Christ here. And may God be using you to accomplish that. God used people in our church. And amazing thing to see in our own lives what God has done through uh, my wife and I. And what we've seen the Lord do through our lives and, and those around us and even missionaries in Nicaragua, you men that are doing the work. And God laid on our hearts um, just a few, few months back and wanting to help get some of these men some transportation because most of them have no transportation. And to be able to pastor church and have people and to be able to visit and go soul winning, try different areas and reach out, they're just they're very limited with that. And so we began praying about how God would help us to do that. And um, I began selling coffee a little bit here and there. And um, God used that, and I didn't sell hardly any, but God began to work in the hearts of others and was able to get two pastors, two vehicles. And uh, man, they're just so excited, bringing people to church. And it's an exciting thing what God has done. Yesterday, our, our son, Nathaniel, he's our middle son, he's starting a church in Pennsylvania. He uh, stepped out in faith. He was offered this opportunity of this church to start and uh, they presented it with him, to him, and he prayed about it, felt that that was what God wanted him to do, and so he's doing it. He's stepping out in faith, and her mom and I, his mom and I asked him many times, Nathaniel, what do you got here? Do you got a place to live? You need to get, he sold his car. He's looking for a car, and what are you going to live on? He's like, well, I'm just trusting the Lord with that, you know, and, and, uh, and mama, she's the one that worries about him, you know, and uh, well, Nathaniel, what are you going to live on? She said, he said, mom, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. And yesterday, a missions pastor, our sending church, called me. I sent an email out of his letter and what he was going to do. If they wanted to help, they could help him. And he called me yesterday, and he said, uh, tell me about Nathaniel. Uh, we want to help him. And um, I'm going to present it to the deacons tonight, and we're going to talk about it. And so he called Nathaniel, asked Nathaniel. He said, Nathaniel, have a car? He said, no, I'm looking for a car right now. And, uh, but he met with his deacons last night, and Called Nathaniel later. He said, Nathaniel, we got you, got you a car. You got $10,000. Go get one. $10,000. I don't know how he got that much money. It's an amazing thing. And today he was able to be, he found the car today. He's going to get it tomorrow and uh, be on his way. And is just be able to see. We're trying to hold the ropes for those in Nicaragua. Somebody's going to hold the rope for Nathaniel to get to Pennsylvania to start a church. There's people involved in all of this. Listen, we're all holding the ropes for somebody. Are you holding? Are you holding it? Are you involved in it? Or are you just walking through the church, sitting down, going home, and going about your daily activity and your business? Listen, it's more than that. It's more than that. It's coming here and getting fed, getting nourished, getting motivated, getting a, getting a passion in your heart as your pastor preaches and the songs that are being sung and the fellowship that we enjoy to be encouraged to go out and do the work, to witness to those around you, to realize that workplace is the mission field for you. That is your Jerusalem. Reno's your Jerusalem. But listen, you have a world to reach for Christ. Are you holding the ropes for somebody? May God, this is, they burden our hearts for it. It's people understanding, listen, it's, I think many times that we've, we've just come into a coma, a, 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 how you say that, a coma state, really. 
We just don't know what's going on around us half the time. There's more to it. Please get a hold of it. Get a hold of it. You're sent. You're sent. The scriptures teach that. Jesus is coming soon. And then lastly, and I'll close with this. Don't forget, remember this. Look what Jesus said in verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. See, how do I do it? You have been given power. The disciples went to Jerusalem. They, they tarried there and they waited. After Jesus ascended, they waited 10 days and prayed. Acts chapter 2, we find the pouring out of the Holy Spirit of God and the church, the local church, was endued with power. The power of the Holy Spirit of God. If you're saved tonight, say amen. amen. If you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit of God living within you. And the scripture here says this promise, this was the promise of the Spirit of God that you'd be given everything you need to be able to accomplish the service for Christ. And I love that word, and I thought about it and the meaning of it. It's the word endued, endued with power from on high. The word endued means this in a sense. The sense it's the sense of sinking into a garment, um, to, to invest with clothing, to array, to clothe, to have put on. <laughs> I love that meaning because the Holy Spirit of God is in us, yes. But think, think of the words that Paul did say, these expressions. And he wanted them to know this in Ephesians. He said, he wanted them to know that they were in Christ. In Christ. Paul said the verse I quoted a moment ago, I am crucified with Christ. That's identification. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It's not me. It's Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's sinking into that Holy Spirit that is in us, but it's understanding he covers every part of us. We're in Him. It's not me that goes. It's the Spirit of God. It's Jesus Christ. Listen, we are here in His stead. Jesus made this great proclamation, I am the light of the world. Jesus said that's one of the great I am statements of the Gospel of John. But do you realize later He addressed His followers and He said this, Ye are the light of the world. Ye are the light of the world. Christ is not here in visible form, but we are tonight, we are in Christ, we're born again, we're followers of Jesus, our lives have been transferred by the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are here in His stead, and we've been given the power of the Spirit of God, it completely covers us, we're arrayed in His Spirit, in His power, in His presence, who He is, and we go forth, not I, but Christ, and oh, may the Lord help us. With that, I'd like for you to turn to passage and I'll close with this. But in Luke chapter 9, just a reminder of this and to remember what our mission is as Jesus was because we're in His stead and we go in the power of the Holy Spirit in Luke chapter 9. In verse 50, uh, look in verse 54. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? But he turned rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit you're of, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went from the village, turned to Luke chapter 19, Luke, Luke 19, familiar passage, I'm, so, I'm sure to many of you, Luke 19, 10. Jesus said this, verse 9, First of all, Jesus said unto them, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham, verse 10, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. It's our mission. It's what we've been given to do. Do you notice the word seek? Some people say, I'm not going to talk to anybody unless God draws them to me. That's contrary to Scripture. That's contrary to the, to the mission of Christ. We are to compel them to come. 
We are to actively pursue. Relentlessly pursuing the lost that they can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's my job and that's your job. I don't care if you hold a position or not. If you're a child of God, that's your job. We are in the stead of Christ to seek and to save that which was lost. There's a harvest out there, okay? That harvest takes work. Remember Jesus in John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman. Remember this story when she uh, found and she understood this is the Messiah? She, he knows everything about me. And she went into the city and she told the whole city who this Jesus was. And he told them everything that she'd experienced. And this man knows everything about me. And the whole city comes out to meet Christ. What does Jesus do? He tells the disciples to look up. Look into the fields. They're white unto harvest. That didn't just happen. There was a woman that understood something. There's somebody who can change your life. And she went and told the whole city. And here they come. There's a harvest out there. But at harvest... In order to have the harvest, it takes work. It takes work. Paul talked about that fact about planting and watering, but God gives the increase. And our job is to plant. Our job is to water. Our job is to continue to go and pray and seek the Lord that that harvest will come. We're in the stages right now in Ohio, and when we go back home, they'll be in that planting stage. And for farmers in Ohio, it's all year round fertilizing those fields and you know when they have fertilized it because there's an odor throughout the whole county and they bring everything out of the hog farms and the horse barns and the cow barns and they spread it all over the field and I'm going to tell you it's, it smells and you smell it for days year round that work but when fall comes they're harvesting but it takes work are you willing to get in the field you're sent if you understand the scriptures you will understand you're sent you're sent and if you understand that you're sent you'll understand this God has given me the power to be able to do it it's not I but Christ don't forget your mission many times I believe we're part of all of the work and all of the labor. Remember the church in Ephesus and Revelation? They, they were busy. They were doing and works and the de- everything that they were supposed to be doing. But then Jesus said this, I have somewhat against you. You've left your first love. You've forgotten why you're doing what you're doing. Let God stir our hearts tonight. May as we come back here this coming Lord's Day, may we come in awe and wonder of what Jesus has done. And let the scripture stir you. Let's get out and truly follow the command and the call of being sent. And may we go in his power and plead it daily in the word, daily in prayer, that the Holy Spirit of God can just continually flow through our lives to bring forth Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for pastor here and just the faithful years of service. Bless him, his wife, their children. Thank you for this church family. And thank you that there's a gospel preaching church in Reno. And I pray, God, that you'd use them mightily to understand it's here in Jerusalem, but it's all nations. And we're each responsible for it. May we understand the scriptures. You're coming again. We will see you as you are. We will stand before you. May we understand we're sent. Thank you for the power. May we claim it. May we live it. In Christ's name.